We are here with the recall session for NEET PG exam conducted on March 5th. So primarily, uh, why are we doing this session right now is a question which uh, most of the people would obviously be asking. So as I've been telling so many number of times, there are just two reasons why we're doing this. One is a retrospection from a teacher perspective. It's purely mine and for the other teachers to see as to whether what they have taught has been originally uh, important and have actually come for the exam. Second is from the perspective of the student who is preparing this year for the coming NEET exam or for the coming INI exams to just be sure as to the areas, like are these areas uh, uh, exactly important and what I'm studying is really what's coming for the exam. So that those are the two things. But this year, there is a bit of a bit of a dilemma. More than a dilemma, I would say this year, there is a bit of a, a strategy-wise uh, issue because it's strategy that matters finally. So strategy-wise for the student and for the teacher, this is a little tricky because uh, we have been having exams of a completely different genre till 2020. Many of you may be aware, some of you may not be aware. The exam pattern was extraordinarily tough. That is when uh, we really started to step up the gas because the exams are in 2018, 19, 20 were really, really tough. And 2020 Jan was when the last of such exams were conducted and after which we had COVID and a huge gap of almost 20 months or so when there was no exam. And then after NADBOT has come up with three exams in 21, 22 and now 23. And all these three exams have been very simple, very straightforward. Uh, you can actually call it as moderate difficulty, but I wouldn't even call it as moderate difficulty. It's like mild difficulty only. So it's like more or less very easy kind of papers. But we really don't know whether we'll be having such an exam in future or whether we'll be having a couple of such exams more before next eventually takes over. So that is why there is a bit of a dilemma. So as a student, as a teacher at this point, we can just strongly believe that we'll just start, we'll prepare accordingly and take it from there. And as and when we get new inputs from the ministry or from the board, we'll just try to flex accordingly. So let's just try to look into this paper. Let me just try to make it very, very clear as most of you would know. Without any kind of a coaching, without any kind of help from anywhere, just basic reading, uh, getting some notes from the market and reading would definitely be enough to answer around 130, 140 questions in this paper. So it's that easy kind of a paper. And for a student who is just prepared, and that means watched a few random revision videos, watched, I mean, did a few questions, maybe 500,000 questions in total and done two or three grand tests. For him, scoring 150, again, correct, is a very simple exercise. So when you look at the paper on the whole, when you look at the paper on the whole, the basic impression that you get is this is a very easy paper and that I need not actually prepare too hard to, to basically get a good rank in this paper. And when you write a paper and get 150 questions correct out of 200, that's a very solid feeling. Very solid feeling in the sense that I am getting three-fourths of the questions right in an MCQ exam. And getting three-fourths of the questions right in an MCQ exam gives you a lot of happiness. And from the outside and from the perspective of a student preparing, that gives a lot of confidence. Because when I was writing the exam, if you get three-fourths of the questions right, then you are rank one. Because the scores were very low in contrast to now, where the scores are very high. So students get foxed by this. Let's see what would happen in that context. So if you get 150 questions correct, you get 600 marks, correct? And you get 50 questions wrong, so you subtract 50, so your score is 550. So 150 questions correct, for which you require only very minimal expertise. I'm saying even with very basic MBBS knowledge, you'll get 130 questions, right? Some kind of preparation here and there will get you 150 questions. And this 550 score, is roughly equal to a rank of 8,500. So 550 score is equal to a rank of 8,500. 150 questions correct has put him in this rank of 8,500. Now let us see, uh, we can actually take the paper and say there are 200 questions. For me, there are approximately seven to eight rank determining questions in medicine. So it's not tough questions, but seven to eight rank determining questions, which a student who has studied at a higher order or probably who has more sense and more application and more exposure would answer. And there are hardly one or two questions which I would put as a really tough questions, which are very difficult to answer, which means even if you are prepared at a higher level, it may be difficult to answer. So seven to eight and one to two. When I analyze the paper in total, you can say that there are say approximately 20 to 25 rank determining questions. Okay, 20 to 25 rank determining questions and say five to 10 really tough questions. So, so five to 10 really tough questions and 20 to 25 rank determining questions. So let us just try to put it this way. Now say you have studied a bit more. So you've studied a bit more. So what means that there are approximately 35 questions in this paper, which are dicey, 
which means it can go here, it can go there. 20 to 25 are of the higher order, which means you need to have a higher level of understanding to answer that. 5 to 10 are really tough, which means even if you study, you may not be able to answer that. And there are five questions which are really confusing, ambiguous questions. Can't be called tough because there is no definite answer for these questions. So we really don't know what to do with this. So if you add up all these things, you will together get 40 questions, okay? You will together get 40 questions, So which means that, okay, 40 questions are in that bracket. So suppose I study better and get 160 questions, which is very much practical. If I study a bit more, I get 160 questions. 160 will actually give me a score of 640 minus the 40 wrong questions. I get a score of 600 and 600 would put me in 2500 rank, which is a very, very good rank, very decent rank right now. More than decent, I think it's a good rank because it definitely gives you much, much more options. So between these 10 questions, you jump from 8500 to 2500. Now for the student who has gone to the next level, who has been able to answer these rank determining questions, he should get to this 170 point. And this 170 point, which gives him 680 minus 30, that is 650, that will put him at 350 rank. And this is actually the brilliant rank, what you can put it. And uh, there is nothing much of a difference between a person who scored rank 1 and 350 because they're all in the same order, one or two questions here and there. So you can see that from this 150 to 160 to 170, there is a big transition. And this poor guy who is answering 140 questions correct and feeling that he is doing a reasonably good job is getting 560 minus 60 questions wrong, which is 500. And he's way out. Can't say way out, but still very far off from a probable good seat or a good clinical seat or maybe what he can call as a, a seat where he can he can actually establish himself because most of your MBBS has been uh, very paltry to say the least and that's why this course is so pivotal in your career because finally we're all studying to treat a patient nothing much we have learned with respect to MBBS in treating a patient what we have with us is just three years it's in these three years that we have to learn the trade of treating a patient the trick of treating a patient whatever you call it and that is what you're going to apply for the rest of your life so this course is the rate limiting course and this exam is the rate limiting exam which means that every rank counts and you get a better college you are in a better state so that is why these rank matters so the point is that it is just these 10 or 20 questions that are finally making the difference when you theoretically see 150 questions and 170 questions, so the person scoring 150 is such sitting at 8,500, person scoring 170 is sitting at 350, 180 would be rank 1, that's a different thing, rank 1 or between rank 1 to 10. So 8,500 to 350 is just a matter of 20 questions, it is just a matter of 20 questions. Okay, so that essentially means that although from the outside when you see the paper, the paper looks very easy, very simple. These 10 or 20 questions or 20 questions to be very specific are the ones which determine whether you reach where you want to or you don't reach where you want to. Once again, ending up in a poultry center because most of the people are driven by this course thing. Everybody wants to take medicine or radiology or surgery or dermat. And essentially what happens is driven by that course thing, you may get into a poultry college, once again do a poultry course and then uh, it's in God's hands, whatever happens. So I essentially want to drive in this whole idea and although the paper is very easy, there are a large number of easy questions, large, large, large number of easy questions. It is those rank determining questions. And in medicine, I have myself spotted those seven to eight rank determining questions and one to two tough questions we'll be discussing here. And those are the ones that have made the difference. But can you answer that by broad understanding? No. Can you answer that by reading the notes? No. That has to be answered only by very solid, solid concepts. And that is the simple reason, again, that we have another very important statistic, which I have, again, discussed a large number of times. This year, if you see, if you see last year, 80% of the toppers, toppers means the first thousand ranks, where people have given the exam the second time. And 15% had given the exam the first time. Okay, and another 5% three third time. So people have written subsequently have fared very poor, which again means time is not the delimiting factor. It is strategy that matters. If time were the delimiting factor, people writing fourth time, fifth time, sixth time should get better ranks, but that's not happening. And people from 2008 batch MBBS, 7 batch MBBS are writing this exam, which means we're having a big chunk of population writing. This year, this has actually changed over to roughly 65% second attempt and 30 to 35% of first attempt. Okay, which means people are giving the exam for the first time. All the first time they've been preparing for two or three years because they've been preparing from their third prof or second prof. So they've been preparing for some time, but the attempt is the first attempt. So first attempt people are able to back large number of ranks, large, large number of ranks, which is primarily again because they are not in a position to segregate. They don't segregate what is easy, tough, 
this is more higher order, lower order. No, did they actually learn for the purpose of MBBS? Because their course has been uh, affected so badly by COVID that they had no option to study anything. So they've been using this. And before they could realize as to, okay, this is too much, this is less. So they could gauge, they have actually studied. And that is the reason those people have come out with extraordinary ranks. By the time you finish the course and by the time you are an intern and you have finished the course and you've written an exam, got a bad rank and then started preparing, you will start to gauge. You will start to compare, okay, this is good for this, that is good for this, anatomy is good in this, physiology is good at that, this person teaches this way, that person teaches that way. And then you may actually end up making a big mess of it. So primarily have good faith, good confidence in the system that you're following, in the app that you're following or in the, in the class that you're following and just and actually have it to the fullest. And as far as our learning pattern is concerned, I am, I think a person, at least one person should be there like that to remind you all the time that you're studying this to become a doctor tomorrow. So that is what I'm trying to do all the time. Even if you find a little fault in that, I'm perfectly okay in that. Because unless and until I remind you that, uh, I mean, many of you have forgotten that in basic, because after 12th, you came for MBBH, been studying some theory notes, again, getting some notes, watching some videos. I've forgotten the fact that you've been studying all these things to treat a patient at some point in time. So essentially, that's important. And we don't know where the exam is heading to. And if it is next, then it is going to be a clinical battle altogether. And whenever you're writing your RCP or your MND, which at some point, many of you will be having to write or will be writing, uh, is also so much clinical. It's a clinical battle altogether. So on that note, let us try to go get into this. Understanding that far number of questions are easy, but answering easy questions don't take us to where we want. So basically, we have to be answering the rank determining questions. Now, pause, ponder and push is um, a common theory which you actually get to see many parts of Europe people use this. Pause, ponder and push means who should pause and ponder and who should push. And this H, S, there are actually, two, there should be five or six H there. I can put only two H. Which means that you are a final prof student or you are actually an intern and you've been preparing from final prof. There is nothing to think. There is no pause and ponder. There is no thought. It is just push, just push, keep pushing. You're right on target. You're right on the money. You've started preparing at the right time. You have the right gadgets with you. Learn, learn, learn. Everything you learn is a bonus. And try to learn as much as you can. Then revise as much as you can and use whatever. In terms of medicine, if you are having a bit more time, you go for the original edition 6 videos. Short on time, go for med 80 videos. Then revise with the revision and MCQ. And you just go for the exam. Like that, every subject. And you have supreme faith in the person who may be watching the videos. Like, for example, when I watch Rohan uh, Rohan's video, now, I'm not a surgeon. I have learned surgery maybe 10 years back. In these last 10 years, I have not learned anything with respect to surgery. I have not seen a theater. But I get confidence. I get confidence. Okay. That if I watch this, I will answer. I watch Akshay Mam's videos. I get confidence. I watch this. So the confidence level for each faculty differs. Some people are able to generate extreme levels of confidence. That's why they're very successful also. So that is uh, exactly what I want. So you should be having full faith and full confidence. You never watch half-hearted, half big with an idea that mm, this will happen or that will happen. That's not the case. You just go ahead. Now, the point is for a few people, this is a time to pause and ponder. Pause and ponder are for people who are not actually taking this exam by the scruff of the neck. That's how you should be taking this exam. There is only one way you can attack the bull, that is to take the bull by its horns. If you don't take the bull by its horns, then the bull is going to eat you up. So essentially that level of uh, what do you say, application, commitment, or those are the regular words that you use. I don't want to make it more complicated, but I mean, those people should pause and ponder because uh, this is an exam where uh, next year, approximately two and a half lakhs are going to appear. So when in an exam where two and a half lakh people are appearing and you're appearing for the course that decides what is going to happen in your life, you say every person will become another way, very successful. They've all had a very, very good postgraduate training. Anyone you see has got a very, very good postgraduate training. It's, it's the PG course that actually takes you where you want to. So that way, this exam is so important. So for them, they have to really pause and ponder, think about the preparation, think about the age, where they're standing now, what kind of a change they want to make with respect to strategy, what kind of a change they want to make with respect to their career. Look at the other options like MLE, look at the other options like PLAP and together make a very wise decision, not just, just like that, keep on preparing, preparing, preparing without knowing what is happening and just allow negativity to come into your system again and again. So people who are fully on, just push on. For people who are actually not performing the way they want to and things are not going right, you just take a break and pause and ponder and always, always, always everybody is willing to help you. And then you just try to think as to what could be the most logical way to go ahead. Because when two and a half lakh people appear for an exam, then majority are going to fail. When if you are a motivator, maybe a bus may not agree with that, majority of people will fail. So uh, only a few, few group of people are actually going to make it to, to the next level. 
So when you see your performance, you can gauge your performance, you can know how much effort you have put in. And even with the effort, if you have not been able to succeed, then definitely time to pause and ponder, look into the strategy, look for other options, look for other subjects, and you have to make a move on. Just wasting time on the exam is not what you want, because this is essentially not like an IAS exam, right? So you're not going to become uh, an IAS officer if you clear the exam. So it's not a job kind of an exam. It's an exam where if you get a seat, you're going to be going to be the junior most person in the system and the slogging is going to start. So we can't waste too much of time on this. Wasting too much of time on this essentially doesn't make sense because it is still a long, long, long way to travel. So time to pause and ponder. And what uh, Dalai Lama has said is again what I'm trying to tell you. Many of the people are, uh, I feel, I, I get to see uh, are generally having some kind of a frustration within the system. I'm talking about people who have given the exam three, four times and you need to conquer that there is no other way you need to conquer anger and hatred and one way you can conquer that is by traveling not to tell you that i'm a very philosophical person i am not at all philosophical i'm very practical with respect to things so that's again what i can tell you you can take a break and again pause and ponder and push on so let us start discussing our questions we get to the rank we'll discuss rank determining and easy questions a mix of that let us see rank determining question number one so this rank determining question number one I hope this question is right. So, in case there is something wrong with the question, of course. Uh, but I think we've uh, we've actually taken it from so many sources, and now we've got enough time after the exam. So, I think this is mostly what is the correct question. So, 23-year-old medical student, two months a clinical question, two month history, palpitation, sweating, restlessness, sweaty palm. Clinical features are uh, depicted in the image given and diagnostic findings. So. This is on reading a very simple question because they have asked, they've given uh, tiredness, restlessness, sweating and all those things. And they gave an image which was equal to this darolimpal sign. We have so many signs in hyperthyroidism. So, this is darolimpal sign. And you can see this rim of sclera around the cornea on looking straight forward. So, this darolimpal sign was given. So, what are they looking for in this question? Okay. So, everybody on seeing this itself, many people, uh, okay, thought, okay, we are dealing with this thyrotoxicosis. Some people uh, thought that we are dealing with hyperthyroidism. Few of them really don't know the difference between thyrotoxicosis and hyperthyroidism. So, for them, it is easy. They thought like hyper, that's what they think. But in real terms, what is thyrotoxicosis? What is hyperthyroidism? I think I have discussed this. So, many of you will be knowing this also. When you are having symptoms due to increased free T3, increased free T4. Okay, not total T3, total T4. When you are having symptoms due to increased free T3, increased free T4, that is actually called as thyrotoxicosis. Thyrotoxicosis can be due to a problem in the thyroid gland or can be due to a problem outside also. When it is due to an over-functioning thyroid gland, when it is due to an over-functioning thyroid gland, then it is called hyperthyroidism. When it is actually due to something else, which means like for example, a stored hormone release something, it is not due to hyperthyroidism, then broadly you can call it as it is due to thyroiditis. So, thyrotoxicosis is symptoms due to excess free hormones, which can be due to an overfunctioning gland. Overfunctioning gland is called hyperthyroidism, not an overfunctioning gland, which is probably relating to some kind of a stored hormone release, thyroiditis. Uh, thyroiditis context, you have two major two thyroiditis to remember. One is subacute thyroiditis, which is called ECO, decure veins, granulomatous thyroiditis, and silent thyroiditis, what we call the postpartum thyroiditis. I'm not going to the details of that. Hyperthyroidism, which is due to an overfunctioning gland, can be again divided into Primary hyperthyroidism, okay, primary hyperthyroidism and secondary hyperthyroidism. Primary hyperthyroidism means the problem is in the gland. Secondary hyperthyroidism means problem is in the pituitary. So, secondary hyperthyroidism can have only one cause, which is a TSH secreting adenoma of the pituitary, anterior pituitary. Primary hyperthyroidism can be having so many causes, but three most important causes which come to our mind when we think are one Graves disease, which is autoimmune. Second is your uh, toxic nodular goiter and second, third is toxic multinodular goiter. So, toxic nodular goiter, what we call as toxic adenoma. So, Graves, toxic adenoma, toxic MNG. So, these many things will have to come to your mind. Okay, if you are a good student, if you don't know anything, you can think this is hyperthyroidism, thyroid hormone excess, etc. Then also you are okay. So, now the next question is, why have they given this Darrell impulse sign? They have given darolimpal sign just to tell you that, okay, this patient has ophthalmopathy. So, whenever you are having ophthalmopathy or dermopathy or clubbing, which is acropathy. So, ophthalmopathy is there or dermopathy is there or acropathy is there. Then what is that you have to infer? That means that all these causes are out. All these, all these causes are out, which means dermopathy, ophthalmopathy and acropathy, if you see, are associated with autoimmune. And otherwise, also 80% or so of the causes of Thyrotoxicosis is due to autoimmune and this autoimmune condition is called Graves disease. So, autoimmune hyperthyroidism is what we call Graves disease. 
Correct. So when you got the question, you know that you're dealing with thyrotoxicosis because the patient has symptoms. Thyrotoxicosis has so many causes. Obviously, you know that it is hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease just because they gave you this one finding that is that is viral impulse sign or any ophthalmopathy finding or any kind of these uh, findings, whichever you get to see. So because of this, you know that it is Graves. Once you know that it is Graves, uh, so that's why T3, T3, free T4, TSH values, nothing else is required. So you know that it is Graves. Once it is Graves, what is the diagnostic finding is the question. This is where you are actually in trouble because you know that antibodies are there, different different antibodies are there, you know TP antibodies are there, you know microsomal antibodies are there, you know TSH receptor antibodies are there. Everybody knows that these antibodies are positive in hypo and hyper. So then you need to be having the next level of understanding to answer this question. That is why this is a rank determining question. Up to this point to say that it is Graves disease, majority will be able to. Some of them who have not studied will even by default say that it is Graves disease. If somebody who has not studied anything will say that this is thyroid hormone excess. But to say which among this is important, you need to have the next level understanding. That is where somebody has to help you because otherwise it's not easy. And this is what we have actually discussed in class. So this is the same slide that we have discussed in class. So you can just see that this is a higher level understanding. Higher level understanding is that there are three antibodies, TSH receptor antibody, thyroglobulin antibody and TPO antibody. I think all of you would have heard of these antibodies. And as you can see from this uh, table, this table is taken from William's textbook of endocrine, which I taught in the class. This table is not even there in Harrison. So even if you read Harrison, you may not be able to answer this. But next level understanding means many classes generally uh, in all this is discussed. Even some pathology teachers also discuss this. See, in Graves, this is TSH receptor antibody 80 to 95 percent, 50 to 70 percent thyroglobulin, TPO 50 to 80 percent. So, like different books give different values, but generally around 90 95 percent, which means the answer to this question is anti TSH receptor antibody. Okay, see, and you can see the same thing I can ask you with respect to autoimmune thyroiditis, that is the opposite of Graves, that is Hashimoto, where maximum 90 to 100 percent you can see is TPO antibody. So, in Hashimoto, it is TPO antibody. In Graves, maximum is TSH receptor antibody. But still remember that 50 to 70 percent thyroglobulin antibody, 50 to 80 percent TPO antibody. But this is something that we have highlighted. And this is something that will take you to the next level. So, next level question. That's why I call it, I do call it as a top question. Because somebody who has seen a patient with Graves will definitely answer this because he would have seen the report. If you are a house surgeon, if you have the habit of copying this report, okay, this antibody, this antibody, this is an antibody profile that they do for Graves. If you have the habit of copying that profile, copying the profile onto the case sheet like we have done during our internship, even without seeing the class, you will answer. So, that's why it's a rank determining question. So, this is the first rank determining question. And the answer to that is thyroid receptor antibody what we call the anti tsh receptor antibody okay okay so this is the table that i've been talking about so be very clear with what is thyrotoxicosis what is hyperthyroidism the causes etc this is a slide that we have done on graves disease again to show you about the fact that this is the most common the hlas which have been asked for the exam so many number of times including ctla4 ptp and 22 association with smoking postpartum and retroviral therapy and this phenomenon called jord based phenomenon Iodine supplementation in a deficient area in a person with an antibody or a nodule is called jod based I've told you the differences between jod based and wolf chaikov effect and all those things. So please go back and study it in total so that you develop an understanding. It's a very short module. It's a very easy to understand module. And somebody who understands this once uh, will have it in a system. So it's don't have to go back to that again and again. So that's about question number one. From there, we go to question number two. Question number two is a very easy question. It's nothing to discuss in. They've just asked for the murmurs. It's a basic MBBS question. They've asked for a pansystolic murmur. Where are you going to get a pansystolic murmur? And pansystolic murmur is in MR. So there's nothing to discuss in that. Even if I teach or somebody else teaches or whoever comes or doesn't teach at all, so this question is absolutely not going to make any change. And there is nothing to discuss over this. But again, my only advice is that uh, MS, MR, AS and AR. I've tried to summarize everything as a single module after discussing in this individually in great detail. So, if you can just go back and see that and you consolidate everything together, even if you get a top question from here, you may actually be able to answer. So, the message from here is this question, there is nothing to discuss, but the message from here is that these four topics uh, at every level, at your MBBS level, at your PG level, even if you take if you take a medicine, is going to be important. Even your PG case is also going to be an MS plus MR short case. So, if you take up that, uh, if you take a medicine as your post graduation, I think entire course course, you'll be having to know this. So, this way. So, there's nothing to discuss on that. Pansystolic murmur is something that we discuss left, right and center and everybody knows. TR, VSD are the other causes. Let us go to question number three and rank determining question number two. Rank determining question number two is on a patient who is having hypertension 
taking multiple drugs for hypertension and they have given a ECG. Okay. This ECG is a very straightforward ECG. Somebody who has very minimal understanding will be able to pick up that this person has uh, very tall T waves. Okay. Very tall T waves. And more than that, he has uh, more findings are there on the ECG, like a prolonged PR interval is there, QRS complexes are a little bizarre. So, all that you do not have to know. If you just pick up these tall T waves, that is more than enough. And I think majority, 90 to 95 percentage of the students were able to pick up this tall T wave. So, tall T wave is there which means that this person has hyperkalemia. So, hyperkalemia is there. So, in other words, they are asking a simple pharmacology question, which among the following drugs produce hyperkalemia? So, which among the following drugs produce hyperkalemia? Thiazide diuretic, prosimide, uh, sorry, thiazide diuretic and loop diuretics, including prosimide, uh, then the thiazide diuretics, whatever it may be, including hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothaladone, indepamide, whatever, they are all going to excrete out potassium. So, they are all going to cause hypokalemia. So, hypokalemia is with thiazide. And spironolactone, you know, can increase potassium. Propranolol, you know, can increase potassium. Losartan, you know, can increase potassium. So, all these three drugs can actually increase potassium. So, some of the students were thinking that this is a question which is wrong, where all except was not mentioned or something. Okay, that is what some of the students were thinking. Some of the students thought like, what is this? This question is wrong, basically, because there are three drugs causing hyperkalemia. And let us try to look into this question in a bit more detail. Hoping that these are the correct options. Okay, so we had some kind of a research on this, and most of the people are agreeing to these options, and that there is hyperkalemia. Okay, so in that case, what will you mark? In that case, what will you mark if not looking into the entrance angle and you are asking me as a treating person? So you are just taking the phone and giving me a call and telling that your aunt is there, she was having hypertension, she is having hypertension, and that is not getting controlled with drugs, and some doctor made some change here and there. And after one week of the change, she started developing uneasiness, giddiness and palpitation. They went to the casualty and took an ECG and ECG was showing tolerance even checked potassium. Potassium came as 7. If you call this and tell me, my first reflex response, what will be my first reflex response? Even from house agency level, I think my first reflex response is, did somebody add spiral electron? That will be my first reflex response. So, that is, uh, that is always there. So, the drug that we give, the drug that we chop and change, the drug that we start and we see maximum number of hyperkalemia coming to the casualty, coming to the OP or because hyperkalemia has very non-specific symptoms. I told you that so many times it comes as uneasiness, giddiness, dizziness, palpitation, twitching, so many, so many non-specific signs. But when you see that, okay, when you see that, it is very often associated, when you think that is associated with the change in drug and you are adding a drug, then very, very, very often it is due to aldosterone antagonist. So, without any kind of a preparation, if you are just asking me as a doctor, as a clinical person, if you are asking me this question, I will blindly mark the answer as pyranolactone. I have nothing to think. Okay. But if you are not having a hospital expertise and you are still having to answer this question, what will you answer? That is where you should be actually showing your senses. Your senses are that this is the slide. This is basically what we call as renal tubular acidosis type 4. I think how many of you remember this, I do not know from the class. Renal tubular acidosis type 4, the first thing that we study about renal tubular acidosis type 4 is that renal tubular acidosis type 4 has to be thought about whenever somebody comes with a hyperkalemia that is disproportionate to degree of renal failure. So, hyperkalemia that is disproportionate to degree and duration of renal failure or a very disproportionate hyperkalemia should always, always make us think of RTA4. Correct, that I told you. And then in RTA4, we are actually dealing with what? Aldosterone related issues. Yes, aldosterone related issues. And in that aldosterone related issues, it can be a true deficiency of aldosterone, true deficiency of aldosterone, or it can be a pseudo hypoaldosteronism. Pseudo hypoaldosteronism. And it is the pseudo hypoaldosteronism causes, that is the acquired causes for pseudo hypoaldosteronism, which make maximum sense when we refer to this term called RTA4 or the acquired causes for pseudo hypoaldosteronism. And when you discuss the acquired causes for pseudo hypoaldosteronism, the first major cause that has to come to your mind are drugs. Okay, the first major cause that has to actually come to your mind are drugs. And drugs which cause pseudo hypoaldosteronism, again, the first thing that comes to your mind is aldosterone antagonist. Okay, then these ENAC blockers, right? Then CNI and then this trimethoprim. Trimethoprim has a structural similarity to triamterin, and these ENAC blockers are amyloride and triamterin. So, trimethoprim is structurally very similar to triamterin. So, whatever side effect is there with triamterin, you will see with trimethoprim also. 
So, uh, amylorite triamterine, CNIs, that is your cyclosporin, tacrolimus, trimethoprim, aldosterone antagonist, including spironolactone, eplirinone, and now the non steroidal uh, antagonist, which is called finrinone. Okay, so all these things are directly responsible. So, if you think that way, and you look at the slide where we have actually mentioned this very clearly that hyperkalemia is disproportionate and never will they have normal RFT but hyperkalemia is disproportionate and whenever you think of this the first thing that comes to your mind is definitely pseudo hypo I mean pseudo hypo drugs and in drugs these are the major drugs apart from drugs there are a few other causes also like chronic tubular interstitial disease especially due to sickle reflex nephropathy obstruction all those I have discussed specifically so they are some notorious causes but when you get this question, spironolactone has to come to your mind. So, most of the students actually had a problem with this, but many of them ended up marking spironolactone somehow because they all felt spironolactone can cause. I'm still not sure of the exact question, but if this is the exact question, the answer is spironolactone and that's a rank determining question. Okay. So, from this rank determining question, let us move to two very easy, easy questions. Okay. Nothing rank determining. A uh, 78 year old woman presents with progressive decline in daily activity. Convulsion stares off into space with frequent visual hallucinations, shows a Louis body with neurons. So, they're basically just trying to check for where are you going to get a Louis body. So, where are you going to get a Louis body is the question. Alzheimer's, Huntington, Prion, Parkinson. So, whenever you talk of this Louis body thing itself, you're talking of Parkinson and you're talking of Parkinson plus syndromes. And whenever you talk of these Parkinson plus syndromes, again, we have discussed this so many times. We have this Lewy body dementia, we have this corticobasal degeneration, we have this multisystem atrophy, we have progressive supranuclear palsy. These are the Parkinson plus syndromes and we've seen how to differentiate between Parkinson and Parkinson plus syndromes. And this is exactly what we have studied, you know, Parkinson with dementia and dementia with Lewy body. What is the difference? Essentially, they are all having this uh, Lewy body inside, but the difference is that hallucinations occur very late in Parkinson hallucinations occur very early and cognitive impairment occurs within 12 months of motor manifestations and this is at least 12 months after motor manifestations that is the most most important thing tremor is very common in parkinson tremor is much less common predominantly unilateral symptoms bilateral symptoms axial symptoms and gait difficulty are less common axial symptoms and gait difficulty are more common so this is exactly what i told you know, when you think of parkinson and with dementia when you think of Dewey body with dementia what are the differences first is that parkinson will be having dementia at a much later point dlb will be having dementia at a much earlier point hallucinations are not common in parkinson hallucinations are very common in dlb dementia unilateral symptoms asymmetrical symptoms in parkinson bilateral symptoms in dlb dementia axial issues are actually speaking much less common in parkinson axial issues and gait issues are more common in dlb dementia and of course tremor which is the classical symptom of parkinson is much less common in dlb correct this is very very clear so if you know it that way you come back to this question even if you don't know any of these things basically you are dealing with uh, dlb dementia and they've even shown the picture of this louis body and i've also shown this in class what do you, are you going to mark prion? Never. Are you going to mark Huntington in a 78 year old person with all these things? Nothing. Are you going to mark Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's is not going to have this. It is going to have these neurofibrillary tangles and senile plaques and this apoepo and all this. It's a different ball game altogether. So, uh, it is about, uh, mostly about different, see different set of things. So, anyone and everyone will be looking for DLB dementia in the options because DLB is not there. The best possible answer to this is Parkinson's. So, sir, actually speaking, this question could have been made very complex, but they have not made it complex. They want everybody to answer this. So it's a very simple, easy, straightforward pick. Okay. And uh, advice, not advice, I don't like advising anyone, but a point from my side is MSA, PSP, CBD, and DLB. Okay, please study, study in big, 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 big detail. PSP and CBD club together and study because they are tau pathies. DLB is an alpha synucleinopathy. MSA is also an alpha synucleinopathy. Whenever you think of MSA, MSA A with autonomic syndrome, shite tracker, MSA C, cerebellar symptoms, keep in mind, CBD, alien hand, and all those things, PSP with this recurrent fall, and all those things, and so many findings in PSP. And C, and of course, DLB dementia, the profile which we have discussed. Okay, so the message is very simple. Anybody who has dementia out of proportion to motor symptoms with bilateral, axial, and gait involvement, with hallucinations at a much earlier point has to be thought of as DLB image. Okay, next is another very, very easy question in the same regard. Complaining of restlessness, difficulty in expressing emotions, uh, resting tremor, rigidity, which part of the brain is involved? In? And then we can again see that loss of dopaminergic neurons in the basal ganglia. I have drawn this big, heavy circuit and taught a very complex circuit because I thought understanding that circuit is very important to understanding the disease. 
many people have not studied the circuit because they found it themselves very hard to understand the circuit. But this is the circuit. What can I do? I don't make any topic easy or difficult. A topic is easy or difficult depending upon the merit of the topic. You mean you basically can't do anything for that. This is a circuit. You can't do anything for that. And that same thing is the reason why this is a very, very easy question. They have not asked anything complicating. It's basal ganglia. So these are two easy questions. They are not rank determining questions. From there, we will move to one rank determining question. This is a rank determining question number three. Rang determining question number three is a CNS question where a patient comes with sensory loss and weakness of limbs for three months having angular stomach. Because of angular stomatitis, I don't know whether you can keep it as a rank determining question. Because of that, many people got this question correct. Uh, there is so because of angular stomatitis, everybody thought of vitamin B12, and because of vitamin B12, they answered subacute combination, which is a correct answer. So, because of angular stomatitis, uh, this question I don't know whether can be classified, but otherwise, this is a definite trait rank determining question. Loss of proprioception, vibration sense, human type of lower limb weakness, absent angular correct so in this case uh, you have sensory you have uh, umn lower limb weakness angle jerk is absent so there is some lmn also so lmn sensory umn so lmn sensory umn uh, extra dural cord compression als cord subacute combined degeneration ms als means no sensory. The moment you have sensory or autonomic etc., then you strike off ALS because MND is that one condition where you can have LMN plus UMN features. But LMN plus UMN features have to be there in the absence of what? Absence of autonomic involvement, absence of sensory involvement, absence of cranial nerve involvement, absence of cognitive involvement. That is the hallmark of ALS. Okay, so no ALS. Then comes multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis never ever comes like this. Multiple sclerosis and this pattern is completely out. And this element human combination is also out. This is never going to be multiple sclerosis, especially with this absent angle jerk and the other one. Extradural cord compression, I told you, you know, goes through three stages. First the radical pain, then the brown sequard syndrome kind of pattern, and then going for element at that level and human below that level, which is obviously not the case. So this is also out. So, if you have a clinical grounding with respect to how to come to diagnosis on element pattern of weakness approach, element human combined pattern of weakness approach, which we have discussed in great detail, then it's very easy. But even otherwise, also many people got this angular stomatitis and because of that, they escaped. Some of the people who are more brilliant try to analyze the question and got the answer. Some of the people who did not know anything saw angular stomatitis and marked the answer. Either way, they get four marks. But I still believe it's a standard question. So, we have discussed this again. So, posterior column is the first structure to get involved. Corticospinal tract is the second structure to get involved. Peripheral nerve is the third structure to get involved. In posterior column, it is vibration sense that is the first thing to get involved. Okay, please go back and see spinal cord. Spinal cord has been done with a lot of effort and spinal cord is a pretty tough topic. But if you do understand, it will help you in some way or the other for the exam. Rank determining question number four. Chronic alcoholic patient presence of this question, I think, is a little easy. Chronic alcoholic patient presence with acute pain and swelling of the left great toe. Synovial fluid analysis shows raised glucoside. Serum uric acid is normal. What is the diagnosis? This was the question. Only simple. This is the question. Now, uh, somebody who knows nothing, okay, somebody who knows nothing, uh, even without MVPS knowledge, many people know, no? drinking alcohol is related to hyperuricemia. Somebody might have answered this as scout. Some of the people were a little bit more brilliant and they answered it to septic arthritis. So, let us just come to this question very simple. Let us leave the alcoholic part. Pain and swelling of a single joint. Okay. Pain and swelling of a single joint, which means that you are dealing with acute monoarticular arthritis. Yes. Acute monoarticular arthritis. Correct. Acute monoarticular arthritis. What have we discussed? Anybody who has uh, basic idea in medicine will be knowing that acute monoarticular arthritis is either crystal or is infection. So, acute monoarticular arthritis at our level, practical level, has only two options. One is crystal, second is infection. Whether it is crystal or infection, they are both coming under inflammatory arthritis. They are both coming under inflammatory arthritis. Hallmark of inflammatory arthritis is increased WBC in the synovial fluid. So, hallmark of inflammatory arthritis is increased WBC in the synovial fluid. Anytime you are having more than 2000 WBC in the synovial fluid, we call it as inflammatory arthritis. This again we have discussed in great detail. But if the counts are say more than 50,000 etc, then you think more in terms of septic arthritis. But if the counts are more than 50,000, then you think in terms of septic arthritis. But here count number is not given. They have just given it as raised which does not tell us anything apart from the fact that this is just a simple inflammatory arthritis. So, this is inflammatory arthritis. The question is, is it crystal? Is it infection? Okay. Crystal can be divided into gout and pseudogout. There are still more crystals, but let us say gout which is MSUM and pseudogout which is CPPD. So, is it CPPD disease? Is it MSUM disease? Is it septic arthritis? So, there are three options now. 
MSUM, CPPD, and septic. Yes, reactive arthritis never ever presents like this. It is a oligoarthritis. It is not a monoarthritis. It is oligoarthritis. It is additive arthritis. It is asymmetrical arthritis, painful arthritis, following an infection. So it's out. MSUM, CPPD, septic. CPPD can actually present, but CPPD first attack will definitely involve the knee joint. So there is nothing called CPPD first attack without involving the knee joint. So this is basically going to be very, very unlikely. And CPPD is seen more in an elderly person. CPPD, uh, there is nothing that's suggestive to answer CPPD, correct? So many people had this doubt, is this MSUM, is this septic arthritis? Uh, okay, now. Why should you write septic arthritis? Synovial fluid analysis shows raised leukocyte is a feature of inflammation, nothing else. Serum uric acid normal has got nothing to do with gout. I have discussed this again. Thank you for the team to actually figure it out. 40% of people who are having hyperuricemia will be having normal or low uric acid. So, 40% of the people who are having hyperuricemia leading on to gouty arthritis will have normal or low uric acid at the time of attack, which is something which everybody knows. So, at the time of attack, you basically need not, need not ever have what increase in uric acid levels. So, that is again there. Then, alcoholism is something that triggers gout, correct? Alcoholism is something that triggers gout. And left great toe involvement first time is so classical of gout. Septic arthritis most commonly involves a knee joint. So, alcoholic patient, no history of infection, no focus of infection, no talk about infection. WBC is a very non-specific thing. Serum uric acid normal can be seen in acute gout, which we've discussed so many times, which everybody knows. And that is the reason why this is acute gout. Okay, many people marked it as septic. Some people marked it as reactive. I can just tell you that your clinical grounding is not strong. That's it. Your clinical grounding is strong. You can't go wrong in this question. Okay, so approach to acute inflammatory monoarthritis, approach to acute inflammatory polyarthritis, approach to chronic inflammatory polyarthritis. These three approaches have to be pakka. Acute inflammatory monoarthritis is crystal versus infection. Crystal versus infection. Acute inflammatory polyarthritis is mostly viral versus early RA. Chronic inflammatory polyarthritis is mostly RA and then you have this RA-like kind of pathologies where there is no erosion, no? like SLE, Jogren and all that. And of course, something like chikungunya and all which can present as chronic and sometimes sarcoidosis and all those things. Sometimes osteoarthritis, which can be erosive osteoarthritis, all that we have discussed. So, please go and be clear with the approach. Approach to arthritis is where you have to be learning this. Okay, that is rank determining 4. Let us go to few more ECC. 40-year-old female came with chest pain, palpitation, shortness of breath. MDM was heard and prominent A wave on the JVP. So, MDM is heard, A wave is there on the JVP. When you are having MDM and A wave on the JVP, you can think that this is TS, you can think that it is MS. Okay, there is nothing wrong in thinking like that because MDM can be heard in TS and MS. A wave can be heard in what? MS and TS. But if you look into that, as we have discussed so many times, again I can show you this. We have discussed this so classically. Uh, MS, I told you, to get an A wave, you should be having RVH, you should be having pulmonary hypertension. Then on top of that only, you are going to get an A wave. That means you are going to be getting into the fag, fag end, where the patient is going to be very, very sick. Okay, whereas in TS, straight away you can get an A wave because what is the pathology behind a large prominent A wave? That the atria, the right atria is contracting more vigorously. Why is the right atria contracting more vigorously? Because there is more resistance at the side of the right ventricle. When is there resistance from the side of the right ventricle? When there is a stenosis between the right atrium and the right ventricle, which is your MS, which is your TS. That is why TS or even a myxoma, right atrial myxoma or atrioventricular valve myxoma is something that can cause a very, very prominent A wave. So, prominent A wave with a diastolic murmur means although both these are going to be right most of the students know that TS is one of the major causes for this. Now some of them try to analyze this question. So they have chest pain, they have palpitation and they have shortness of breath. Chest pain is mostly with respect to activity right. Chest pain is with respect to hypertrophy that means that you are trying to pump against resistance. So when you are trying to pump against resistance you, you actually can get chest pain, but that is non-specific. You can't account it into MS or TS. Palpitation is a wrong symptom here because it is related to volume overload. In either case, you will not get volume overload. And shortness of breath is very non-specific because shortness of breath can come on either side. You can't say, I told you, know, left heart, right heart, we don't have concrete boxes. So, symptom-wise, nobody can actually make any kind of an assumption here. Prominent A wave always is TS first. MS is much, much later on. And if you study this under JVP, we look into the prominent A wave causes and large A wave, naturally it is TS that stands out. 
Hypercalcemia is a paraneoplastic syndrome is seen in squamous cell malignancy, which we've discussed so many, many times. Even Ila ma'am has actually commented on this many, many times. It's a very easy question. Almost everything else is small cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma is hypercalcemia. And we have talked about this PTHRP being the villain and PTH suppressing PTHRP. Our big list of causes for that in squamous cell malignancy of the lungs, squamous cell malignancy of the cervix, squamous cell malignancy of the head and neck and everything we have discussed. Once again, trying to tell you that hypercalcemia is very important. PTS related hypercalcemia, PTHRP related hypercalcemia, vitamin D related hypercalcemia, miscellaneous causes for hypercalcemia, that whole bracket of hypercalcemia is easy. And I think everybody has caught this question, right? Okay, now let us go to rank determining question number five. This is uh, actually truly a tough question, uh, not tough question, I'm saying. Uh, next level understanding is required for this question. Patient presents with severe restlessness tremors to the emergency department. Okay, not discussing the theory behind this question, just on approaching this question. Asthmatic patient comes with restlessness tremors to the emergency. So, swollen neck is also noted. So, which means that this patient has uh, coming to you with a thyrotoxicosis. Okay, thyrotoxicosis. So, thyrotoxicosis patient has come to you. Thyrotoxicosis patient has come to the emergency department primarily because he is having palpitation. Although they have not mentioned that tachycardia is noted and ECG showing AFib means he is going to have a rate of say 200 around where we will be having severe palpitation restlessness. So, because of which he has come for palpitation. Nowhere in this question they have mentioned that this patient is in storm. He may be in storm, he may not be in storm. Storm should have an underlying precipitating factor. Precipitating factor is also not mentioned. And storm related fever, delirium, seizure, coma, nothing mentioned. So, why should you think this is a storm? You need not think as a storm. I am having Graves disease. I did not take my drugs or I am having something else or I miss my drug. And today I am having a rate which I know always my rate is slightly on the higher side. No? Many of the people do mention this. When they hold on to the railing of the bus, it's so they can actually feel ta -ta 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 -ta. every time they feel the ta -ta -ta, they know that. But sometimes this gets out of hand. Sometimes it gets so out of hand that they start feeling severe, severe palpitation. That is when he came to the casualty, thinking that this is sinus tachycardia itself. But when you took the ECG, you understood that no, this is not sinus tachycardia. This is atrial fibrillation and hemodynamic stability has not been mentioned. So, we think that this is hemodynamically stable atrial fibrillation. Correct. If you think that this question is thyroid storm, you should be knowing what is thyroid storm. We have discussed in detail what is thyroid storm, precipitating factor, fever. Consciousness impairment, delirium, seizure, that is thyroid storm. This is not thyroid storm. Okay, even if this were thyroid storm, the first priority has to be to correct the rhythm. He will go for hematomic compromise, they are stacked, arrested. At the. Okay, so anyway, fibrillation is the priority. Okay, so in this case, which is a definite factor is there and you want to treat atrial fibrillation, let us look into the options that we have. So, when you try to control rate in atrial fibrillation, we have verapamil diltiazem one side, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, esmerol, purpur analog, digoxin, but digoxin we are not considering now. Okay, so we have what options? Beta blocker option, we have calcium channel blocker option, two options are there. And in this question, at a very basic MBBS level, they have told you that patient is having asthma. So, because of asthma, you can't mark beta blocker, you have to mark diltiazem. Large doses of PTU are useful in storm. Okay, provided the patient is hemodynamically stable in sinus. If the patient is in fibrillation, then treating fibrillation is the priority. And that is what we have discussed. I have told you when to go for rate control, when to go for rhythm control, what are our options, how much duration, etc., etc., giving amyotron. All that we have discussed under AFib. AFib has been discussed under ECG. So please go and see that. But in this particular question, I am not wasting time discussing all that. Just to tell you the most important take home point that this patient, in from these details, doesn't really have a storm. And even if he has a storm, it doesn't matter because it is the rhythm that is most important. Okay, and this patient is in AP. Correct. So, this is a rank determining question because only if you have a higher level understanding, you can answer that. Next ECC question cough and chest discomfort, right upper arm pain and ptosis and all that. It's a very easy question. Pankos tumor, Horner syndrome. And this is the entire pathway that I have actually drawn. You can see first order, second order, and here you can see you no know, between this T1, T2 and C7, C8, we can have the upper lobe tumor going in compressing. So, this is the complete complete thing. If you want, you can study first order neurons from the hypothalamus, then C1, C2, then C7, C8, third order neurons going via the internal carotid artery going to the pupil, ptosis, partial, meiosis, anhydrosis, apparent in ophthalmos and loss of sinuspinal reflex. So, that's again a very simple question. Even if you have not watched the video, you should be very easily answering this. Rank determining question number six. Penetrating cervical neck trauma, piercing the lateral aspect of the dorsal column tract, which of the following will be seen? So, this is a definite rank determining question because you have to be knowing the pathway properly. So, as far as the dorsal column is concerned, 
you know that the decussation happens at the level of the medulla and decussation doesn't really happen at the level of the spinal cord. So, decussation happens only at the level of the medulla and decussation doesn't happen with respect to the spinal cord means it is going to be ipsilateral loss. Yes, it is going to be ipsilateral loss. Correct. Fine. So, when you know that it is ipsilateral loss, so you can see absence of ipsilateral. And then in the spinal cord, what did I tell you? Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. That is medial to lateral for the corticospinal tract and the spinothalamic tract. So, for the corticospinal tract and spinothalamic tract, it is cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, medial to lateral. Whereas, for the posterior column, this Krishna Kumar has also taught you, I have also taught you, for the posterior column, it is sacral, lumbar, thoracic, cervical, that is from medial to lateral, which means that lateral most part will be cervical here. So, when cervical is ipsilateral, proprioception of the arm. Okay, spinal cord anatomy, spinal cord tracks, that's why I told you, spinal cord as a module is very vital, it's very pivotal module, our understanding of spinal cord is so important, whether it be transverse myelitis, whether it be GBS, again, you can actually compare with that at that point, whether it be uh, subacute combined degeneration of the cord, whether it be intradural, extradural, intramedullary, extramedullary, on the whole, conus corda, everything together, spinal cord is a pivotal module. And if you're planning to take up medicine in future, it becomes an even more pivotal module because all your final year MD exam, you'll be actually be asked questions in and around this. So, this is another anti question where proper understanding is required. This is a tough question. Uh, Dialysis is useful in the definitive management of hyperkalemia. During dialysis, patient develops disequilibrium. What is the treatment and all that? So, this is a tough question. And you can see that we have discussed this under dialysis module. Okay. You can see that discussed under dialysis module. I myself feel like laughing, seeing me in different forms. Like remember of those times where you shot this. Okay. So, what is this? This we have discussed now. Every time you go for a dialysis, this is a tough question. I, I don't think many people will answer this. We need to have very higher order knowledge to answer. Or else you should have accompanied patients for dialysis as an intern. If accompanied patient for dialysis as an intern, you will answer this. So, every time we do dialysis for generally say 4 hours on an average, this is the time that we do. First session of dialysis, I told you hemodialysis, always we do for 2 hours. We do for 2 hours. The reason behind this is, first time you puncture the IJV and put a patient on dialysis, the major worry you have is what we call as this dialysis disequilibrium syndrome, what we call as DDS. DDS is a very, very simple thing, which means we are having blood on this side, we are having the dialysate on this side. Your dialysate has no urea, no creatinine. Blood is full of urea, creatinine. Urea value high, creatinine value high, very, very high. So, when you are actually having a blood urea and creatinine very high, and urea being this very small molecule, Urea will just like that, just like that, just like that diffuse. It will just like that diffuse into the dialysate, from the blood diffuse into the dialysate, from the blood diffuse into the dialysate. So, it diffuses straight away into the dialysate because it is a small molecule which moves by diffusion. Across the dialysis membrane, you have only two processes happening, diffusion, ultrafiltration and of which the major process is always diffusion. So, by diffusion, all the urea goes very quickly. By diffusion, all the urea goes very quickly means the osmolality of the blood will come down drastically. So, water concentration in the blood will be now very, very high because the osmolality is lost. And this water will have a tendency to move from the blood to the cell. And when it moves from the blood to the cell in the brain, it causes an increase in ICT. And these ICT symptoms are basically what we call as dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. So, DDS is actually speaking due to an increase in ICT that is caused by the rapid transfer of urea. Correct. That is the reason why every time we take the patient for dialysis, I mean, sorry, first time we take the patient for dialysis, we are very, very, very careful about this. And that's why first dialysis session, we try to do only for two hours. We try to keep a very, very low pump speed, very, very low pump speed. We go for a co-current flow. Generally, dialysate and blood flow are counter current. Here we go for a co-current flow, low pump speed and two hours dialysis. These are the precautions that we take to prevent DDS. So, that is exactly what they have asked here. DDS is basically due to an increase in ICT. So, naturally treatment has to be managed. Okay, this I am not including under rank determining question because majority people wouldn't answer this. I hope, I think so, but there may be even brilliant students who may answer this. But increase in ICT is the thing and that is essentially what is responsible for that. So, first HD, keep 2 hours, low pump speed, try to remove less volume and try to keep a co-current flow. Right, so we go to the next question. Very simple, easy question. Somebody has been tested for HBSAG and HBAG positive and you have to treat him. Or in simple terms, how do you treat a patient who is having chronic hepatitis B? And they've given all sort of options. And uh, I think I have taught much beyond what has been asked for the exam. Because I told you so many times, liver is like one topic very close to heart and love teaching liver a lot. 
So this is the period. No, this is how this is evolved. The same slide that we have discussed. So many things have happened over the years. We started with interferon alpha, pegylator interferon alpha. There had a lot of issues. It was not working in Asian patients. It was not useful for HPAG negative patients. It was not useful in people who had cirrhosis. It had to be taken by an injection. It caused all sort of side effects, including thyroid issues and psychosis issues and all that. So then came uh, interferon with uh, adepover. Then came lamivudine. Lamivudine had YMDD mutation. So then in the current era, entacaver or tenofovir. So drug of choice is entacaver or tenofovir. Now we have this newer tenofovir called tenofovir alafenamide, which does not have the routine tubular toxicity of tenofovir. So right now it is tenofovir alafenamide. And I told you that we really don't know how much to treat or how long to treat in hepatitis B. There are so many unanswered questions in hepatitis B. We really don't know how long to treat. So we just treat for life. And here they have not mentioned that more than 40 weeks. Tenofovir alafenamide they have not mentioned. Tenofovir they have mentioned. So it's a very simple answer. It's a very easy question. Nothing much to know. We have discussed everything regarding this. And even if you have not, I mean, watched any video or anything, even if you have just studied in your random notes also, it would have been very clearly given hepatitis B, when to treat, how to treat, intricacies and all, they wouldn't have mentioned. But here they have not asked that. I always try to teach one step ahead, maybe just because of the fact that in an exam hall, you can answer only that. The only questions are one step below your level. In the exam hall, answering a question that is one step above your level is impossible. But even answering a question that is at the same level at which you have learned is not possible. So that's why learning one step above is very useful. And here, these are all wrong options. It's only, you know, it's a very simple question. Okay. Then we go to another question. This is also called as a kind of uh, tough bar. I would probably put it as an ambiguous question. Okay. This is not a clear question because so many people are having so many different ways of uh, putting up this question. So, Malcolm will discuss this question in detail along with the image. I just thought of coming back and telling you this. So, CD4 count, some people say was not mentioned, some people saying is very low, some people saying 150. Cough and weight loss has been mentioned, sputum CBNAT negative is mentioned, bilateral nodular infiltrates with skin lesions have been mentioned. So, some people think it is cryptococcosis, some people think it is histoplasmosis. So, again, I am not sure as to what they really wanted. If they have mentioned a more subacute kind of a picture with a TB kind of a mimicking illness with a CD4 count of somewhere between 100 to 150 or maybe even up to 200, you can think of histoplasmosis. Okay. But if they mentioned like the CD4 count, which is 8, they mentioned about more nodular infiltrates, bilateral lung fields with skin lesions, you can think more in terms of cryptococcosis. So, either way, you can think. Some people are giving history which is looking like histo. Some people are giving history which is looking like cryptococcosis. So, you please go back and see the discussion, uh, Malcolm's discussion as well as my discussion on infections in HIV that we have done. You can understand both in this particular question, depending on the question you answer. Because if it is 8, then I wouldn't even read the question further. I would mark it as cryptococcosis. But some people say that was not given. So then you can think of histoplasmus. So it's kind of an ambiguous question. I'm not including it under random determining questions. Young man, early morning backache, stiffness, lung expansion, low red eyes, too much MBBS level, ankylosing spondylitis. Nothing to discuss on this. Uh, everybody knows everything. But again, to tell you that spondyloarthritis, please go back and study. Spondyloarthritis is a very important topic, what we used to call a zero negative spondyloarthropathies. Presently, we call them as spondyloarthritis, the reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, enteropathic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and juvenile onset spondyloarthritis. Okay, so all that is important, but this particular question again, nobody has anything more to think of. HIV patient with the lesion on the palate, the exact lesion that we've shown in class, and this is Kaposi sarcoma. Again, it's a spotter question, very simple, very easy. Rank determining question number seven. So, this rank determining question number seven is on a pituitary tumor. Patient underwent surgery, has sodium 155 and osmolality 100. So, very easy that you know it is central DA. Okay, very easy. You know it is central DA. Question is very simple. Central DA requires treatment with desmopressin. I have taught that. Everybody is taught that. Everybody knows that. So, you have central DA patient requiring desmopressin. Desmopressin, I told you, we get it as mineral nasal drops, which we give us 10 to 20 microgram BD intranasal, or you can even give oral desmopressin 0.1 mg starting dose to maximum 0.8 mg BD. So that everybody knows, and everybody knows that it is DDAP. The problem is DDAVP for lifelong or DDAVP for two weeks and discontinue. This is the question. Okay, that is where next level understanding is required. That's why this is a rank determining question. Now, whenever you are having a pituitary tumor, either you can remove the tumor or you can actually remove the entire pituitary, which is called as hypophysectomy. Okay, if you remove the pituitary or if you remove the tumor, then the management will change. If you remove the tumor only, then you can have a transient DI. And this transient DA can be treated with desmopressin for two weeks and that is more than enough. If you are having a removal of the pituitary per se, if you have removed the pituitary per se, hypophysectomy, then that means that you need to replace lifelong. Okay. 
this is i don't know whether it was mentioned in the question so if they've not mentioned pituitary tumor underwent surgery large pituitary tumor means patient has mostly gone for hypophysectomy many of the time the patient goes for hypophysectomy it's only in microadenomas that they are able to salvage the gland mostly they are not able to salvage the gland so taking that into consideration if nothing else more than this was given you probably have to answer it as lifelong but if they mentioned that they've removed the tumor only and left the pituitary intact then probably you can mark it as two weeks but i think with this heading that large pituitary tumor and the sodium has become 155 there is so much of central da it is in a transient central da you'll be having only mild sodium high 143 144 like that so 155 and osmolality rock bottom 100 i probably feel that they've removed the pituitary so that is my guess and if they've removed the pituitary always it is ddip for life Okay, so with this question again, it's a rank determining question, but the point is you have to read the question properly. And this we have mentioned very clearly also. That means that you have to be giving this, there is no option, but in case it's a transient DI, you need not give this. Okay, stock transaction and all, you can actually see in the videos. I'm not going to the theory behind this, but it's a very basic point that it depends on what has been removed. Right, we go to the next question, which is rank determining question number eight. A child is presented with cola colored urine and hypertension and puffiness of the eye. So, easily everybody knows that this is nephritic syndrome. So, there is no question on that. Also called acute glomerulonephritis. Creatinine is 2.5. Creatinine is 2.5, which is okay because in acute glomerulonephritis, what are the points acutely the patient will present? The patient will have hematuria, which is manifested as cola colored urine. The patient will have hypertension, naturally hypertension, and the patient will have mild renal failure. So, renal failure. Cola colored urine, hypertension, acute onset. This is called as acute nephritis syndrome or acute glomerulonephritis or just nephritis. That's it. Now, in this case, uh, we are really worried about what all things we are worried about patient having hypertension related complication, we're worried about renal failure leading to hyperkalemia, we're, late, we're worried about intravascular volume expansion, those things we are worried. Now, here treatment was started, what treatment, antibiotics you give, and conservative management only. Uh, patient did not improve and his creatinine came to 4.5. So, creatinine 2.5 has become 4.5. This is where you need to have proper understanding. Without that, you, can, you cannot answer this. 2.5 to 4.5 means it is very rapidly progressive renal failure. Rapidly progressive renal failure in the glomerular context, you have to call it as RPGN. So, this is a case of PSGN. PSGN is going into RPGN. So, PSGN going into RPGN. Correct? So, whenever you are having RPGN, classification of RPGN is based on immunofluorescence. Where you are having posse immune, which is type 3, immune complex mediated, which is type 2, and anti GBM disease, which is type 1. And under immune complex mediated RPGN, we have SLE, we have HSP, and I have told you PSGN. Mostly it is the adult PIGN which goes into RPGN, but childhood PSGN also can go into RPGN, say 0.6%, 0.7%. It's a very rare thing, but childhood PSGN can go into RPGN. So, what is the diagnosis in this case? Diagnosis is PSGN patient has gone into RPGN and RPGN is the first cause for RPRF. Correct. What did I tell you? Whenever somebody develops renal failure over a period of hours to days, it is called AKI. When somebody develops renal failure over a period of days to weeks, it is called RPRF. RPRF is what we are actually seeing here and RPRF has got first cause that is RPGN. Second cause for RPRF is HUS. Third cause for RPRF is AIN. Okay. So, here the first cause is RPGN. Right, and RPGN is PSGN going into RPGN. And whenever PSGN goes into RPGN, it is what type? It is type 2 RPGN. Correct. So, classification is based on this. You can see linear staining for IgG. This is actually your anti GBM disease type 1. Granular staining, you can see, which is your PSGN going into RPGN, that is type 2. Absolutely no staining, scanty background, that is posse immune, that is type 3. Okay, type 4 and type 5 are subtypes of 1, which you can see. Most common is type 3 which is posse immune and you can see type 2 immune complex mediated type 1 that is anti gb okay now let us come back to this question when you come back to this question they have asked for electron microscopy finding so rpgn is a clinico pathological diagnosis correct it is a clinico pathological diagnosis i keep on telling this all the time clinico pathological diagnosis means clinical part is rprf pathological part is crescents so, when you are having parietal epithelium proliferating with some fibrin and other inflammatory cells, that is called as a crescent. And here what you see, you see a proper crescent. So, crescent on light microscopy with the RPRF clinically is what we call as RPGN. But that is light microscopy. 
electron microscopy what are you going for so if you have this granular staining of igg and all that i have told you and i have shown you the if picture also but they have not asked for lm they have not asked for if they have asked for em and em in pstn is characterized by subepithelial camel hum deposits the subepithelial camel hum deposits are called our famous lumpy bumpy deposits so many times discussed even pathology has been discussed but you should be knowing this in total many people mark the answer as crescent crescent is not em finding lm finding means you can mark, mark it as crescent em finding is subepithelial camel hum deposit which is called as the lumpy bumpy deposit and the ia finding is called as the starry sky pattern correct so what should you be knowing to answer this question that primarily this is pstn okay acute glomerulonephritis due to psdn psdn has gone into renal failure so that is rpr progressive renal failure rapidly and inside that it is rpgn it is rpgn type 2 rpgn type 2 or type 3 or whatever light microscopy finding is crescent if wise there is scary sky pattern there is granular igg deposition all that we have seen and em will show subepithelial deposits and these subepithelial deposits are called our famous lumpy bumpy deposits correct and where else do you see subepithelial deposits? We see subepithelial deposits also in membranous nephropathy. Membranous nephropathy, we see subepithelial deposits. MPGN, classical, we see subendothelial deposits. C3GN, we see intramembranous deposits. IgA, we see mesangial deposits. Here again, we see subepithelial deposits. FSGS and in uh, MCD, we see nothing. IgM nephropathy, you can see IgM deposits in the mesangium. FSGS, you can see focal IgM deposits again. But again, in secondary FSGS, we don't see any deposits. Okay, so again, a kind of a rank determining question. Encephalitis, bilateral temper hemorrhage with cesium roll, just mark and go, mark and go, HSP, nothing to discuss here. Patient from Delhi, 3 days fever, extensive hepatical hemorrhage and WBC count 3000, leukopenia with some anemia with plate count 20,000 and all. Dengue, nothing to discuss, go on, go on. Boy came with fever and chills, positive for HRP2, falciparum, again, just push on, push on, nothing else. Sewage worker, yeah, this is a little interesting. Sewage worker came with abdominal pain, jaundice, conjunctive. So, it's very clearly given as leptospirosis. Leptospirosis, generally, we don't use any of these tests, man. After a week, we go for the leptospira IgM, that's all. But the gold standard test, Shivika Madam has mentioned, I have told everybody has told us microscopic agglutination, but it's not done practically. But in this question, the other options are useless options. So, anybody can mark this. But remember that we don't do this. It is lepto IgM only that we test for. But most people got this question right because the other options are useless options. Patient had altered sensorium, neck rigidity, seizure, HSV, encephalitis, you go for CSF, PCR, yes. And HSV antibody you can get, but the best diagnosis is PCR, we've discussed this so many times. Malignancy, platelet reduced to previous cycle of chemotherapy, we've discussed about filgrass for neutropenia and opravaleukin for thrombocytopenia, recombinant interleukin 11, that is opravaleukin, I have told you this, Ranjan sir has told you this, easy question. Angiotensin 2 synthesis and neprilize in action. So, that is, uh, I think, the same, what they mentioned now, because this is like the wonder drug for heart failure. So, that is your neprilysin inhibitor with the angiotensin blocker, that is the valsart and succubital combination. We've discussed this so many times. Previously, we know that for heart failure, we have now four wonder drugs for heart failure, what we call as the fantastic four in heart failure. One is your SGLT2 antagonist. Another one is your uh, beta blocker. So, we have these uh, wonder drugs in heart failure. Now, wonder drugs in heart failure is currently what we call as the fantastic four in heart failure and in this fantastic four in heart failure i think one drug which is of paramount importance previously was ace inhibitor but we now know that it's better than ace inhibitor ace inhibitors were always better than arb that's another question generally everywhere we prefer arb but in heart failure it is always ace inhibitor because of the radical in action so better than ace inhibitors are these angiotensin 2 receptor blocker plus neprilysin inhibitor this angiotensin 2 receptor blocker plus temporalized inhibitor is what we call as the combination of Valsart and Sacubitril. This is one among the fantastic four for heart failure. Okay, so aldosterone antagonist is a fanta among fantastic four for heart failure. SCLT2 antagonist is among the fantastic four for heart failure. The best is beta blocker. So beta blocker, aldosterone antagonist, SCLT2 receptor blocker and Valsart and Sacubitril combination. This forms the fantastic four for heart failure. Again, pharmacology question, easy question. Previous MI, arrhythmia, fatigue, dyspnea, weight gain, pulmonary fibrosis, simple pharmacology question. We discussed this so many times, amiodron, the side effects of amiodron, sir has also told you so many times. It's again, nothing much to think of. You can just mark and go. Describing a drug that is reducing the synthesis of uric acid for gout. Again, aloperinol. We've discussed about xanthinoxidase inhibitors, febuxostat and 
or that please don't give it unnecessarily. I've seen so many people prescribing for buxostat. For buxostat, will result in all the hair on your head going crazy. But more importantly, cardiotoxic. Okay, so warning is there. Don't give it unnecessarily. If you're having doubts as to whether to treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia or not, please go back and watch the module. Unnecessarily, don't treat. And nutrition everywhere. This is like a person who had some sexually transmitted disease, uh, eating, I mean, not taking enough diet or something. And all these questions I have also discussed, but I just thought of uh, putting it everything together. This is Rebecca Madam in her own slides actually mentioning all these things. You can watch her module on nutrition. I have done a module on nutrition. It's a little bit more complex, I guess. The questions are very simple. So you can watch this and answer everything. Everything you can answer, including uh, McCardell's disease, which we mentioned as rhabdomyolysis. Repeated, repeated. If you get, you think of McCardell's disease. Von Jerkis type 1, I have mentioned so many times. Hepatosplenum megary, lactic acidosis, hyperuricemia, hyperlipidemia, dolphiasis, seizures, hypoglycemia, all that we have discussed. Then, of course, collagen synthesis, zinc deficiency, alkaptonuria, thiamine deficiency. It's all very easy and low insulin uh, glucagon ratio results in increased hormone sensitive lipase and hormone sensitive lipase is the villain because it leads on to lipolysis and lipolysis leads on to free fatty acid and free fatty acids when broken down here will go straight through the portal circulation into the liver they can't enter the mitochondria so they will form fatty acid coa and that will get deposited here and there and form I mean be responsible for resistance so all this okay chloride level so simple man cystic fibrosis everybody has discussed that Large retroperitoneal hemorrhage, intermittent swelling of knees, it's like too easy. It's like hemophilia, eight and nine. Again, so simple question. So these are all the just cake walk, walk through, walk through questions. Simmon factory and all again, a classic question. So when somebody sees these kind of questions, he gets a feeling that I have I already know a lot of questions. If I studied something better, some little more I would have been able to crack. And that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. These simple questions you will invariably answer. You have to come up to the next level. In a competitive race, only what you know up and above your computer matters. I am showing you Dalai Lama in the beginning who says nothing about competition, it's about harmony. But in a competitive rat race, you need to be having the vengeance within your system to really lock on and just push, push forward. Male child won't have mass in the jaw and all. 28, 814, 822 and We've discussed everything about semic and endemic burkets and the other HIV associated burkets and the adult burkett, child burkett, it all the differences, right? Child burkett, let's the jaw, adult burkett is in the abdomen, association with EBV and all that. DIC and 1517 is something which everybody knows, or roads and all that. It's now promyelocytic leukemia, it's a different entity. This AML, uh, M2, M3, M4 and all terms which you're not using. It's like AML with recurrent genetic abnormalities, like your A21 translocation, inversion 16, like that. And 1517 is now your Promyelocytic leukemia. Uh, Splenomegaly, elder brother, and hereditary serocytes like osmotic fragility test. Old test, but still useful. Now, I've told you about ectocytometry and glutathione malate test and all those things, which are the higher order things, but here basic question was asked. If you study higher order and a basic question comes, you can be happy for that. Elderly patient, they showed smart cell. So, what are they trying to tell you? CLL. CLL is a leukemia. It's in the peripheral blood. So, you want to start study the cell. What do you want to know? You want to know the immunophenotyping of the cell. So, you have to be studying flow cytometry and see the cell. Okay. So, if you have to study the cell, then you have to be doing flow cytometry. And on a flow cytometry, I've discussed this so many times. 5 positive, 10 will be negative, 19, 20, 21, 22, and here will be 23 positive. Okay. Right. Madel's own lymphoma will be similar like, but it will be 23 negative. Correct. So, all very simple questions. Spike and dome pattern. Hepatitis B positive is always membranous. Membranous, we've discussed, no? Light microscopy membranous will look very similar to MCD. It's very similar to MCD. Early stages of MCD and early stages of membranous and MCD are very hard to actually differentiate on DLM. It is just the thickening of the membrane, which is a little more thickening of the capillary wall under the light microscope, which is a little more in membranous. But as the disease progresses, you'll be getting a lot more findings like the spike, the domes and all those things. But as you talk about IF, you know, it's okay, right? It's like granular staining of IgG. Diffusely, mostly on the capillary wall, and on EM, you'll be getting the subepithelial deposits. And secondary causes for membranous left and right, so many, many things. A lot of things coming up right now. We recently had a facial cream which is being used by people, and five members of a family were found to be positive for membranous, and it was associated with very high mercury content. Now, all these facial creams that we use. Uh, which we call as the anti-aging creams or some sometimes what we call as preventing wrinkling etc. Those creams are permitted to have some amount of mercury but this was like extraordinarily high mercury content. NEL1 positive membranous nephropathy to us. Okay, so myocardial action potential curve again I think we discussed so many times. Uh, we have this calcium channels here responsible for phase 2 plateau phase 
and this again is from your pft pft basic questions i'm not discussing pft in detail basic questions is on what krishna kumar has taught including what is frc so we've actually closely scanned through all the questions we can still figure out more i think but this is enough the most important take home message is that overall grounding is so crucial to answer these rank determining questions these so called rank determining questions will actually be the most important part that's why they called rank determining questions so how will you are able to answer them will eventually determine where you end up with respect to the exam so you basically have to be smart enough to answer that and i told you first and foremost developing a liking if you're watching a video developing a liking towards that person who is on the other side if you develop a liking towards his style his way of presenting things and his knowledge per se then automatically you will fall in sync with that and once you fall in sync with that you will watch more and more and naturally go forward and for people who who have not watched my videos and who are actually in doubt as to whether they want me to watch uh, i would probably tell you that you you, you i i would always want you to watch me i want to my medicine to reach everywhere i want my medicine to reach across across different countries because i feel that essentially we are all in the same group that means we're all doctors you're planning to treat patients we're trying to treat patients and trying to do our best you're also in that same boat i am also in the same boat i may be few years senior to you there are people who are senior to me there are people who are senior to them so like that so essentially we're all trying to do the same thing so knowledge has to be translated into a performance which is helping a patient so that is the ultimate aim that is why we are discussing this so that's why even if we take one or two minutes extra even if we take one or two modules more the purpose is well and truly well and truly justified thank you